I'm Jessica. Not William, not Mr. Hawkins, Jessica. You see, I'm a transgender female police officer here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> it took a lot more for me to become Jessica than did Sergeant Hawkins. You see, in 1973, when I was born, the word transgender was not very, uh, it was not commonly used, not at all. So, what else was going on? Oh, yeah, mental health professionals, they still considered being transgender a mental disorder. Politicians across the country were ordering police departments to run undercover operations to identify gay men, to lock those gay men up for what? For simply having sex with their partners. <laughs> Unbelievable. 1973, here I was, just born. How was I supposed to tell the doctor that I'm a girl, not a boy? And even if I could, would I? Look at what was going on. So, my struggle with my gender identity would continue the rest of my life. I was raised as a boy. My parents nor I knew any better. We just thought something was wrong with me that I would grow out of it. Well, I did. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> I had so many questions that no one can answer, not that I was asking. I mean, I remember, it's 1973, I was like, yay, hi. Some of those questions included, why am I like this? Do other boys go to bed every single night wishing they would grow up, or wishing they would wake up as a girl, or grow up to be a great woman? I don't know of any of my friends that ever wished that. We never talked about that. So as life continued, I went through high school, I finished high school, and as I was going into college, I was like, what do I want to do? And I realized I always wanted to be a police officer. I just didn't think I'd fit in. But why not? I'm tall. <laughs> you all noticed that, right? <laughs> I'm fit. I'm young. I never got into any trouble. In fact, I never even smoked a cigarette. So in 1994, I began my career as a law enforcement officer in a small town in Virginia. <laughs> A few years later, I applied with the city of Winchester Police Department as a police officer. Now keep in mind, I'm still exploring my gender identity and I'm cross-dressing on the weekends. Sometimes, I would actually get enough nerve to actually step out of the front door instead of staying in the closet. <laughs> so, my travels sometimes would take me on a little road trip and keep in mind, I wouldn't even get out of the car, I just wanted to get out of the front door. And that was a challenge. So I would go to D.C. far, far away. For me, it was 80 miles away, and I didn't think anybody would know me. Meanwhile, the process to become a police officer with Winchester is looking good. Until one day, my background investigator shows up at my house, and he's standing in my living room, and he's looking at me, and he says, you have the job as long as we don't find out you go to D.C. dressed in women's clothing on the weekends. <laughs> I gotta tell you something. Never play poker with me as a teammate. I, we will lose. I have the worst poker face. And that, true, and that proved to be true, because a month later when I called to ask when my start date was, sadly I was not selected. I needed growth and opportunity. And more importantly, I needed to be somewhere in case my secret was ever found out, that it wouldn't jeopardize my career. So I did some research. And what I learned was that part of the D.C. Human Rights Act here in Washington, D.C. protects people like me. It protects gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. So I applied with the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, and luckily, I got the job. Woo. Awesome! <laughs> that was 17 years ago. Some of you are only 17 years old. <laughs> So I went through the academy all over again, and I don't know if any of you have ever know what goes on in the academy, and the police academy is not like the movies, <laughs> but it's a lot of boring classes, a lot of physical agility testing and training, as well as my favorite part was the pepper spray. Yes, you get pepper sprayed, you have to fight in the whole nine yards, but this is something I was willing to do to continue in my career as a police officer. So. 2000, the summer of 2000, I'm transferred, or I'm graduated from the academy, I'm transferred to the 6th District, the Anacostia section of Washington, D.C. Now, for those of you that don't know, back then, Anacostia had the highest violent crime rate in the entire area. 
I'd spend the next 14 years there. Once I got to my assignment, I started you know, talking to officers, becoming friends with them, and I learned that there was another transgender female officer. Now, this department is 150, over 150 years old, and at the time, only one officer came out as being a transgender female. You gotta keep in mind, we're at almost about 4,000 or 3,500 officers, I don't know how many, but we got a lot of police officers, it changes. So only one over all those years? Can't believe it. And here it is, nine years later, after she left, they were still talking about her. What they were saying was the jokes, locker room jokes. They were also talking about her using male pronouns. Not feeling very welcome to explore my gender identity with these guys, I kept that to myself. <laughs> See, when I was off duty, I'd continue exploring that gender identity and cross-dressing and going out at night, pushing my limits further and further. I even bought a single family home far away just so I can come and go with the privacy of a garage and having a backyard and to come and go undetected. It was pretty bad that I was in pure fear when I'd have families and friends visit me and I forgot to lock the office door. You see, that's where I kept all my Jessica clothes. So here I am working in the most violent neighborhood on the East Coast. And I'm more scared of someone finding out about me than going to work every night. At this, at this point, years went by, and I realized I need to get some therapy. I want to get fixed. Enough is enough. So I made sergeant. I started going to therapy. And uh, when I did make sergeant, I was sent to the 7th District, by the way, the other half of Anacostia. I'm like, okay, who did I make mad? <laughs> But you know what? It was the best move that ever happened. Because while I was in therapy, I came to terms with my own gender identity. I am female. That was the fix, just to recognize who I am. So here I am in the 7th district, and I come out to everyone. I disclose my gender identity and begin living as Jessica. Immediately, the younger officers were very accepting. The veteran officers, eh, <laughs> they came around. A few haven't, but at least they're respectful. Things change for me on the street. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> See, I used to get called names like redneck, hillbilly, and other things. Never bothered me. I've been in plenty of physical fights, assaults on the street, on duty, <laughs> and uh, never because of my gender identity. But things change. To date, since I transitioned, I've been assaulted three times on duty because of my gender identity. It doesn't stop there. I would say at least once a week, if not daily, especially when I was in patrol, I would get called names like faggy tranny cop. Are you really a police officer? How can someone like you be a police officer? And my favorite, I've never seen a male police officer wearing makeup before. <laughs> well, guess what? As a police officer, you learn, you gotta develop tough skin. You gotta get over it. And I did. But sometimes I still go home in tears over it. To make matters worse, members of my own community, a transgender community, look upon me as the enemy because of the uniform I wear. I have been asked to leave community events simply because I'm a police officer. It doesn't stop there. My own colleagues, some officers, they avoid contact with me because, well, they don't know how to address me. They don't know what to say. They're afraid they're going to get it wrong. Well, they can't get it wrong, but if they did, it's usually he or something like that, and it still hurts. It's kind of like referring to someone or refusing to acknowledge someone's married name or being called that nickname you so hated growing up. I know someone in here has a nickname that they hated. <laughs> so, March of 2015, I was asked to run the LGBT liaison unit. What an achievement. This is an internationally recognized and an award-winning unit. We went from running stings on gay men in clubs to actually building LGBT or building relations with the LGBT community. That's pretty amazing. My highlight of my career so far is when I have a five-year-old transgender girl look up to me as her role model because she didn't think she could be a police officer. Police departments across the world and across the country 
are recognizing the importance for LGBT liaison officers and LGBT liaison units. With legislation constantly being introduced across the country that targets LGBT people, I have, my fear is we're taking a huge step backwards. When I visit cities and I, know, I learn that their police department has an LGBT liaison officer, I immediately feel relief. Because when you run a unit like the one I run, we're sending a loud and clear message. Not only are you welcome in this city, but we will not tolerate crimes against you because of your gender expression, your gender identity, or sexual orientation. I get asked a lot, and some of the things I'm asked are, was it worth it? Well, that's a good question, because I did lose a lot. I lost most of my family, I lost most of my friends, and I lost my marriage. But was it worth it? Absolutely. <laughs> Am I happy? That's to be determined. But I tell you what, I'm relieved, because I'm not looking over my shoulder anymore, and my confidence is stronger than ever. The only thing I fear now, to be honest, is being alone, being ridiculed on the street, and frankly, traveling abroad and going through TSA. <laughs> My hope for the future is really simple, that transgender men and women, boys and girls, are seen without the adjective, and that they are treated with respect and as equal members of society, and that our children get to grow up being themselves without fear of losing their primary support, their families and their parents. And I never hear of someone committing suicide because of who they are, whom they love. And last but not least, that police officers are looked upon as someone you can trust and not the enemy. Thank you.